I love the the main title of Ted of Ed's talk. Let's all jump in the time machine. And who, who remembers where they were in 1980? Well, 1980 was the year of the Mount St. Helens eruption, so it was a memorable year. I do remember that. I was in my second year of grad school at this time of 1980, and we were having a study group, and that happened and we didn't get much studying done after that. We were all glued to the TV. So by the way, I'm Elizabeth Gage. I'm the office and volunteer coordinator working for WNPS. And I'm gonna make a few announcements and then turn the meeting over to Yanka Hobbs, who's our chair of the CPS chapter. And she in turn is going to introduce Shelly Evans, who will then introduce our speaker. So we have a big roundup tonight. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I did wanna make a couple of announcements. First of all, is that our staff is growing to a team of three. It's been Denise and me since I started in 2016. And we are going, we're thrilled to be adding a volunteer coordinator to the team. This person will provide support for the statewide organization, so all 12 chapters, and they'll be providing volunteer coordination for recruitment of volunteers, orientation, and engagement on, in an ongoing basis. Um, it was described in our latest May e-news, and there was a link to find out more information, which I have put in the chat. So if you're curious about this wonderful opportunity to work with Denise and me, it's a remote um, job, but we'll be getting together at least twice a month. Um, please look for the link, or you can email me at info at wnps.org if you can't find it. So the, a couple of other things I wanted to talk about are we have a couple of wonderful workshops coming up. We have this year's Grasses Workshop, Know Your Grasses Virtual Edition, led by Clay Antonow again. And we also have a botanical drawing workshop with Crystal Shin, who's led several workshops up until now. This one is drawing alpine wildflowers from photographs. And you'll, we'll be using the photographs of Donovan Tracy on the poster that he did for the Burke Museum, which they were kind enough to let us use. So check it out. They're both on the homepage of the website, wnps.org. And um, these are great opportunities. And that's also the place you'll find upcoming presentations. So with that all said, quite a mouthful, I'm going to turn things over to Yanka, who has a couple more things to tell you about. So in chapter news, of course, the big, the big thing that a lot of us have been involved in um, was the pickup for the plant sale is um, this weekend. Hopefully everybody ordered plants online and will come up to Woodenville at their um, appointed hour and or appointed 15 minutes actually to pick up their plants. Um, spent today up there receiving orders and putting and hopefully putting them in the correct slots. Um, thank you for all the to all the volunteers, most especially um, Mary Nakasoni who has um, coordinated the entire project and Rita Moore, who did a um, amazing amount of work on the um, computer um, backside of things. Um, it'll be fun to watch all the plants go off to their new homes. Um, we will have the CPS chapter will have one more um, presentation Zoom presentation um, this month on um, 
it's called, it, the title is nursery school how to select the best plants for your landscape and install them correctly and the um person who is giving this talk is linda chalker scott who um who is basically the person behind the latest update of art krukeberg's gardening with um native plants book so this is this is not one to miss if you are at all interested in growing some of these lovelies yourself. And with that, I will um, pass the um, Zoom to um, Shelley. So I'm going to interrupt for just a minute. Sorry, Shelley. Um, I forgot to mention that we are going to take questions as we go along um, because Ed believes that you'll see a plant or a picture and have a question right on the spot. And we wanna talk, we wanna deal with those while they're timely. So please put your questions in the chat or the Q&A and I will keep an eye on them and um, get them to Ed. So sorry, Shelly, please take it away now. No, no worries, no worries. So for the second time this year, I have a distinct pleasure of introducing Ed Alberson. Ed currently works as the Natural Areas Coordinator for Lane County Parks in Eugene, Oregon. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology from the Evergreen State College and a Master of Science in Botany from Oregon State University. He has worked as a field botanist and stewardship ecologist in the Pacific Northwest for over 40 years. Ed has also authored or co-authored more than 50 popular and scientific articles on a variety of botanical and ecological topics from plant taxonomy and ecology to, to botanical history and exploration. He is an author of the revised keys for a number of fern families for the second edition of the Flora of the Pacific Northwest. Please join me in giving Ed a warm welcome. Okay, Ed, it's all yours. Thanks, Shelly. Hi, everyone. Good to be with you again. I'll uh, work on getting my screen set up here. And um, we also, um, let's see, here we go. We also um, had a poll question for you. Denise, is that set up for people to respond to? There we go. So we want to just see in the audience uh, when you joined the Washington Native Plant Society, which decade? So go ahead and indicate the appropriate decade. And uh, Looks like we've got still a few more people voting. Anyone else want to enter their info? We're up to 70%. Well, that's pretty good. So it looks like the, uh, the most popular decade is 2010 to 2019. 2010s, that's 20% of the people, but really a pretty good distribution. Um, for each decade, we've got at least. Uh, 10% uh, or so of the audience um, represent each decade. So we got some old timers, we got some middle timers and some new timers. So uh, let's see. Um, there. Okay. So let me start my presentation. Do I need to close this, Denise? I think I do. Um, Go ahead and click that presentation button where you are. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. You from Eugene, Oregon, for but um, uh, went to uh, Washington. I kind of got my start in botany in Washington, and so the Washington Native Plant Society was the first Native Plant Society that I joined. I think it was in 1978 when I joined. Not sure exactly when, that was a long time ago, hard to remember. Um, but uh, one of the early events in my uh, uh, era of botanical exploration of the state was uh, being a participant in a four day backpack trip uh, set up by the Washington Native Plant Society to Royal Basin 
in Olympic National Park. And, um, you know, looking back on it, um, it was a really great opportunity to see a lot of interesting plants, but also to join some, uh, you know, really uh, uh, exemplary botanists in the field, uh, people who became fellows of the Washington Native Plant Society. Um, I took a bunch of photos and that's why I'm able to give this presentation. However, I have to admit that um, I only have one photo with people in them and that's the one we're looking at right now. Um, so I'll just <clears throat> introduce the people who are in this photo and we'll talk more about them later. But um, from left to right, the person who's leading the charge here is Buck Buckingham. Uh, the second person with a backpack is Art Krukeberg. The third person is Nelson Bucking Nelson Buckingham wearing a blue jacket and then behind her, Kind of leaning over is Elroy Burnett. And there were a couple other participants in the trip as well. We'll get into that. Um, so here's a, a map of the Olympic Peninsula showing the arrow pointing to the approximate location of Royal Basin in the northeastern part of the Olympic Mountains. Um, the dates are August 15th to 18th, 1980. So uh, well into this into the summer season, but uh, we were at a high, high enough elevation that we're also getting you know, a good bloom. Um, participants included people I mentioned, Nelsa and Buck Buckingham, Art Krukeberg, Delroy Burnett, uh, myself, also Warren Tanaka and Norris Cohn, but um, they actually uh, kind of went off on their own during the day and came back uh, to camp in the evening and told us what they found. Um, I think this is also a noteworthy event in that it was kind of the first uh, Native Plant Society backpack trip. It was before the first of the Jim Riley organized backpack trips. That was a few, few years later, but um, it was definitely something, a good, a good idea. It was kind of a first, first effort. Uh, just to kind of zoom in a little bit more about where Royal Basin is located, the star is locating the specific place. It's in the, um, uh, the Dungeness River drainage. So Dungeness River flows from south to north um, you can see Dungeness Spit at the, at the top of this photograph kind of flowing by Squim. Royal Basin is, I measured it off, it's 18 miles as the crow flies from Squim. So that's a pretty dramatic uh, uh, ecological and uh, uh, elevation gradient there. Um, I am not doing this from memory. I have some assistance. Um, well, I have the photos that I took and I took probably 80 photos, which um, given that I was using slide film Kodachrome, um, each photo costed about 25 cents each. So, you know, for me, that was a lot of money. Um, I think that's an indication of, um, you know, uh, how important an experience it was and how much we saw. Um, also in my field notes, and uh, um, I learned kind of a, a field journal methodology at Evergreen in this, um, uh, basically field, field biology natural history program that I took in the 1978-79 um, school year. And so I'm really fortunate to have these field notes that help jog my memory. And then also Art Krukeberg wrote a really great article for Doug Lassia about this trip. And so it's kind of Art's perspective on what we saw, um, what were the, um, you know, the highlights of the trip. And so um, that's in a, a subsequent issue of Douglas here from 1980. And so that was also a useful reference. Um, I thought I'd just give a little bit of backstory about, for me, you know, coming into this experience where I was coming from. And like I mentioned, I was in a year long program at Evergreen in the 78, 79 school year where that was basically where I learned how to key out plants. Uh, we all bought Florida of the Pacific Northwest and have, had labs where we learned to key out plants. and. Uh, so after the end of that, I was really raring to go to see all sorts of interesting places in the state and see what kind of plants I could find. And um, so I did a bunch of stuff on my own. Uh, one of my trips was up the Enchanted Valley um, on the west side of the Olympic Peninsula, the Quinault drainage. Got to see the largest recorded Western hemlock tree. Although I did some research recently and found that they found another tree that's bigger than this one. I also um, hiked up to Anderson Pass which is on the divide um, between the, um, the coast side and the Puget Sound side. Got to see the Anderson Glacier. Um, interesting to note, I recently saw uh, something on the internet. 
talking about Anderson Glacier is now gone. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's pretty much melted away. So that, um, you know, 41, 42 years ago, doesn't seem like that long ago to me, but it's long enough for Glacier to disappear. Also later in that summer, I somehow um, <clears throat> wrangled an invitation to join a University of Washington field ecology class in the Olympic Peninsula. And it was because a classmate of mine from Evergreen was enrolled in this class. I wasn't enrolled, I was just kind of tagging along, um, but spent several days in the Northeastern Olympics with this class. And uh, it's particularly mo uh, memorable for me because I first heard the word endemic and was introduced into the con concept of endemism. Um, and particularly, you know, the Olympic Peninsula is a, is a great part of the state to uh, understand this concept. This is a field class that was taught by Roger Del Morale, an ecologist at the University of Washington. He's the, the man in the right side of the photo uh, with a red jacket on and a hat. And in his right, right hand, he is holding his copy of Florida of the Pacific Northwest with this really uh, nifty um, book cover with handles on it. I remember seeing those around and people carrying their fish shots with them. Um, I thought that was a great innovation. On that trip, we saw Plisticum crucubergii, which was, you know, it's a kind of a rare fern for us, and I was really interested in the fern, so that was a really cool thing to see. Then in 1980, I actually um, got uh, a seasonal job for four months doing rare plant surveys for the Washington Native Plant Society, or I'm, I'm sorry, Washington Natural Heritage Program, um, WNHP. And uh, I was doing field work in um, Whatcom and Skagit and Snohomish counties. Um, took a little time off to go on this field trip, but uh, here's a photo of me doing those rare plant surveys. It's actually taken the week after the uh, Royal Basin field trip. Uh, I also went to the uh, National Botany Conference in uh, Vancouver, BC. Um, and that was an opportunity to go to a botanical meeting and meet other people, particularly interested in ferns. That was kind of what I was interested in. And also explored around the state looking for rare ferns and Perithelipterus nevidens. This was one of the ones that I was able to find. So, so that was fun. So that's kind of prelude for me, um, you know, where I was at at the start of this field trip on the Royal Basin. Um, and this is kind of at the head of the basin looking downstream. Um, photo is not real great because we had a lot of clouds and mist and some rainy spells. Um, but it's also really good light for photos. So hopefully the photos worked out well. <laughs> uh, just to orient you a little bit better, a few topo maps in the upper right corner, use the cursor here, um, is uh, the junction of Royal Creek and um, the uh, Dungeness River. And that's basically where the trail starts. And then um, cur curves around uh, eastward and then southward up to Royal Basin. And then the next map is kind of the upper part of Royal Basin. And uh, it's right tree line. There's a little lake and there's wet meadows, um, but also a lot of uh, scree and talus and cliffs. Mount Deception in the lower, lower left part of this photo is actually the second highest peak in the Olympic mountains. Uh, it's only about 200 feet uh, shorter than Mount Olympus. Um, but this is the dry side, the northeast side, it's the rain shadow side of the Olympics. So there's not really any glaciers. There's kind of snow fields, maybe small glaciers, but not the big valley glaciers that you find around Mount Olympus. So we're at Mount Deception is, that is 77, 88 feet. We did not get up to the top. It's a technical climb. I think we got up to uh, over 6,000 feet though. Okay, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm kind of kind of uh, go by habitat. So I'll start with the the mid elevation forests that were along the first part of our hike, and, and actually this first photo is along the road on the way to the trailhead, and um, we stopped in this spot where there was a native juniper growing on the hillside on the mountainside, and this has uh, been described as Juniperus meridima. It's kind of the the disjunct populations of Juniperus virginiana found west of the Cascades, mostly around the San Juans, Gulf Islands, you know, at sea level, but there's also these populations at middle elevations in the Olympics on the north side of the Olympics. So that was kind of cool to see. Um, and then the forest in the background, um, Douglas fir is a dominant, but kind of a different species composition. 
Douglas fir and grand fir, but not much Pacific silver fir, and, and also Western hemlock. But typically at this elevation on the Western side of the Olympics or the Cascades, you have silver fir, but we didn't have that. So it's a little bit of a more, more of a drier forest. Um, also a lot of ericaceae in this forest. And so we got to see hematomies congestum, which is one of these um, achlorophilus ericaceae that doesn't have any green leaves at all. It requires a fungus to get its nutrition. Um, and then some other ericaceae that have you uh, that do have green leaves. Camophila umbellata is one of them. Um, Pyrola chlorantha is another. Um, and then we started seeing some kind of unique things for uh, on the, the, uh, the eastern, northeastern part of the Olympics. Lanicera utahensis, which is uh, disjunct from, I think, uh, eastern Washington from quite a ways to the east. It shows up here in this particular part of the Olympic Peninsula, a shrubby uh, honeysuckle. Um, we saw this fur moss uh, in the club, actually club moss family, now called Huperzia occidentalis. At the time we knew it as Lycopodium salago. And uh, these were a topic at the botany conference in Vancouver actually. And so it was great to kind of get to know these and really learn the species as, as they were being defined. We saw some orchids. Here's the uh, one of the rain orchids, Platanthera unalaskensis. Uh, here's a close up. These are uh, the, uh, at one time were known as the genus Piperia. Now, another thing that was interesting and kind of showing how uh, the ecological zones are all scrambled on the Northeast side of the Olympics, um, we came across the subalpine azalea, Rhododendron albiflorum basically side by side with the native rhododendron, rhododendron um, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, our, our native rhododendron, rhododendron growing side by side. Um, and so that's unusual to see those two together, you know, the azalea at a low elevation and the rhododendron, rhododendron at a high elevation. Uh, we started passing some avalanche tracks, so still in the forest zone, but places where avalanches come down and keep the trees from colonizing. And we saw, you know, a nice native thistle, Cerceum eduli, uh, cow parsnip, Veraclium maximum, and a, a nice delphinium, delphinium glaucum, very tall, uh, statuesque plant with small flowers, many small flowers. This is a pretty widespread species, but kind of scattered in distribution. I think it was about an eight mile uh, hike up into the subalpine meadows. So the, that was the first day. Um, and then the second day, so the first day was a Friday. Saturday and Sunday, we spent exploring the subalpine around Royal Basin. And then, so, then Monday was our uh, day to hike out. Uh, so here, uh, Saturday morning, uh, nice sunny morning, uh, view of the upper part of Royal Basin. and. Well, first, I'll talk about some of the plants we sent, found in kind of the more mesic or moist habitats. Um, I, I should mention that this was kind of the sunniest part of the trip. It got cloudy and started raining during the day. Paul Celebor, Veritrum viridi, Veritrum estrotianum. Um, it's not in the Ronchelli City. Sorry about that. It's that family name. Um, uh, in uh, uh, throughout the Northwest. The Plantus latifolius, um, common lupin. Elephant heads, Particularis Greenlandica, now in the Oral Bank ACE. One of the shrubby spirea, spirea splendens, there used to be a variety of sp spirea densiflora with pink flowers. One of the monkey flowers, uh, we used to know this as Mimulus tillingii. Um, now it's called Erythrantha cespitosa. Pronacea fimbriata, um, kind of a delicate flower of wet meadows. This was an interesting find, um, an equisetum, uh, the, the narrow unbranched one, uh, the scouring rush. Equisetum variegatum variety Alaskanum. And it's related to um, 
Equisetum hymeli, which is common lowland species. But this is the only time I've ever seen this, this particular horsetail. It's more of a northern species. I don't even know if it grows in Oregon. Um, so that was cool to see as well. Elmera racemosa. This is in the saxifrage family. This is a, one of the showier, showier uh, saxifrage relatives. Uh, and then one of the uh, alpine bistorts, Bistorta viviparia. <clears throat> um, this is related to um, the uh, more common um, Bistorta bistortoides, used to be Polygonum bistortoides, which is common in subalpine meadows. This one is, is definitely less common in the state of Washington. And you can see um, there's regular flowers at the top, but below that, along the, um, the flower stalk, those are actually little bulblets. So it, it reproduces vegetatively. That's the reason for the name vivipara. Okay, so continuing upward, um, we had uh, lots of different areas to explore, uh, rocks and scree and kind of natural rock gardens. Um, and you could climb the scree kind of up to the base of the cliffs and see what was growing, growing on the cliff without having to do actual rock climbing. Uh, of course, there were the ubiquitous mountain goats uh, 40 years ago, and they're probably still there. Um, how many mountain goats do you see in this photo? I think I see four. Let's go through some of the flowers that were in the, uh, the scree and cliff habitats. Uh, Ranunculus schultzii, variety of schultzii. It's one of the subalpine buttercups, the yellow flowers here. The glacia levigata and the primulaceae are really uh, showy uh, native kind of bun forming plant in the subalpine. Penstemon davidsonii, variety menziesii, really showy penstemon, but fairly common in the subalpine. Another delphinium, this is delphinium gloriosum, and kind of the opposite of delphinium glaucum in that it's a uh, you know, uh, short stature, but large flowers and very floriferous and uh, very showy. Even the uh, polygonaceae in the subalpine are kind of showy. This is Oxyria digina. Again, a fairly common subalpine scree plant. Lewisia columbiana, variety rupicola. Louisias, Louisias are always fun to see. Basilia sericea, this is a variety of sericea. Um, first time I had seen this and uh, really was captivated by Basilias. They're pretty cool plants, especially these perennials. And the Hydrophilaceae. Here's a member of the Asteraceae. Now it's, its name is Tenestis lyallii. At the time, we knew it as Haplopappus lyallii, but Haplopappus has been divided into a number of different genera now. And um, we saw a couple of places, we saw this parasitic uh, member of the Orobanchaceae. It used to be Orobanchae fasciculatum, but now it's a Philon fasciculatum, uh, probably parasitic on the Achillea. That's here, at least that's a plausible explanation. One of the mat forming willows, Salix arctica, it was really cool to see these subalpine willows, you know, being familiar with, with willows as trees and actually quite showy when they're in flower. This is a, a female uh, willow plant. There were a number of interesting ferns and uh, actually the plant list, I should have mentioned this, there is a plant list on the Burke Herbarium, uh, Burke Museum website that um, all the Native Plant Society plant lists are now posted there. Over 300 native plant species have been documented from Royal Basin. Um, uh, the, this plant list was actually started in 1980 on this plant, on this field trip, and then added uh, over the years. But uh, so yeah, over 300 native plant species and uh, 24 native species of uh, ferns and lycophytes. That's a pretty high diversity. 
uh, fern oil in the Pacific Northwest. So um, the uh, holly fern, Polysticum longitis, is a relative of the common lowland sword fern. Um, and then uh, again, we saw Polysticum crookerbergii, which is related to the holly fern. Um, one of the differences is that the individual pinny are more deeply incised, but they're also rotated kind of like rungs of a ladder um, compared to Polysticum longitis. Polypodium amorphum, this is a relative of the licorice fern that grows mostly at higher elevations in the Cascades and Olympics. Um, okay, so I've been kind of leaving for last some of the special plants of the Olympic Peninsula, the endemics and disjuncts. And um, just to get everybody up to speed, uh, endemic in the um, biological, in the plant and animal world, I guess, refers to uh, species or genus, a taxon only, that's native only to a single defined geographic location. And so we're talking about species that are endemic to the Olympic Peninsula. Um, and there are a number of them. Uh, about a dozen uh, species or varieties or subspecies that are in, endemic to the Olympic Peninsula. The number is kind of always changing as uh, you know, new species are recognized and other species are lumped and that kind of thing, but about a dozen. But in addition, there are six species, six taxa, that are found only on the Olympic Peninsula and on Vancouver Island. So there's kind of this shared geography along the Pacific Northwest coast. And we see the same phenomenon with the Northern Oregon Coast Range, species that are shared between the Olympic Peninsula and the Northern Oregon Coast Range. So that's um, kind of part of what makes the Olympic Peninsula special. And I'll show you a few examples that we did see on this trip. So yeah, one of the best known is this bellflower, Campanula piperi, um, which we saw lots of. It's, it's, there's a lot of it in Royal Basin. And so it's a great place to see it. Um, it's a mat forming plant with these large blue flowers that stick up. Um, and I've got a map here, um, an inset, this is um, observations from iNaturalist and the map shows Washington, Oregon, Southern British Columbia, and the red dots are where observations of this species have been made. So you can see how limited its geographic distribution is. Another real showy endemic in the subalpine of the Olympic Peninsula is Viola fletii, and uh, definitely one of my favorites. Um, and here's the map showing its distribution in the Olympics. Um, still just found in the kind of the, the northern and eastern part of the Olympic mountains at high elevations. Another one that we saw is a composite, Senecio neo websteri. I, I like how some of these species of Senecio, their common name is butterweed. I'm not sure exactly where that, that comes from, but. That's kind of a cool common name. Um, and here's a map showing the distribution of Senecio neo websteri. And note that these are all named after important early botanists who collected on the Olymp Olympic Peninsula. Um, I talk a little bit about some of the background of why we have this biogeographic phenomenon of end endemism. And I'm gonna show you a series of what are actually insets from a really cool uh, relief map of the city of Washington by D. Molinar. And this is showing different stages of the Pleistocene glaciations. And um, this first one shows the point in time when the Alpine glaciers coming out of the Cascades and, Olymp and the Olympics were at their maximum, um, maximum extent. And this is actually before the continental glacier reached its maximum extent. So uh, there was land around the Olympic Peninsula that was ice free. And so the idea is that these endemics, they were able to find ground to grow on to survive during the ice age at the time of the maximum alpine glaciation um, on these areas of exposed land adjacent to the mountains. And then the next one shows at the maximum extent of the continental glacier in the Puget Lobe, filling the Puget Lowland down to uh, 
South Sound region. But by that time, the Alpine glaciers had retreated. And so the idea is that, you know, there was perhaps substantial open territory um, on the Olympic Peninsula in the mountains that would provide habitat for these endemics to survive. They could, you know, make it through the glaciation. But at the same time, the Olympics were isolated from the Cascades by the ice, by the low elevation lands, which weren't suitable habitat for uh, plants to grow in rocky habitat. And then the last one is as the uh, continental ice sheet is receding and the, um, the alpine glaciers are receded, the Puget Lobe created a dam. And there, so there's a big meltwater lake occupying what is now Puget Sound. But that only reached an elevation of maybe 300 feet. And so there's still plenty of, of open land on the Olympic Peninsula for, uh, for plants to survive. So that's a little bit of the background. I'm probably not telling you exactly right, but um, I'm not a geologist. But it's a really interesting story. And it, um, you know, our Krukeberg always used to say geology is destiny. And so if you're interested in plants, it really pays to know something about geology. So I'll give you some examples of species that are not endemic to the Olympic Peninsula, but are shared with other regions. Castilea parviflora variety Olympica, we used to think that it was endemic to the Olympics, but then it was found on Vancouver Island. So it's one of those species that's shared across the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, and another example that we see uh, is with Packera fledia. This also used to be a Senecio, now it's been uh, the genus Pacara has been split out of Senecio. And uh, here's the map showing its distribution. So it's in the Olympics. It's in a limited area around Mount Rainier in the Cascades, but not more widely in the Cascades. And then also in the Northern Oregon Coast Ranges. And, and again, these are iNaturalist observations. They don't necessarily show the complete distribution, but this is the pattern that you see. So it just kind of leads you to wonder, well, how, you know, how does a plant get this distribution? Um, but there's actually several others that have the same thing. The Olympics, one lim limited area around Mount Rainier, and then the Northern Oregon Coast Range. Um, and then uh, mentioned Orthocarpus imbricatus, which is disjunct quite some distance. The Olympic uh, Mountains, the Olympic Peninsula is the only place in the state of Washington where this species grows. Um, and the rest of its range is from Central Oregon Cascades southward. So that's a pretty substantial, you know, several hundred mile disjunction. You know, how, how did this happen? How, how could a uh, distribution pattern like this have arisen? The other thing to point out is that this is kind of the situation where um, in the future, incipient speciation could be happening. And with long enough geographic isolation, the Olympic Peninsula Orthocarpus imbricatus could evolve into a separate species through isolation. Okay, so those are examples of the plants we saw. Like I said, um, you know, I showed maybe 50 species, but there's over 300 that are documented from the basin. So um, I'd probably put you to sleep if I went through all of them and I don't have photos of all of them. But I just thought it'd be interesting to reflect on. Um, you know, uh, where uh, the various participants of this uh, trip uh, kind of moved on to, and uh, also the society. Um, this time, 1980, the Washington Native Plant Society was only four years old. Uh, so it was a very new organization. To me, though, it felt like a fully fledged organization, very functional, uh, regular suites of meetings, field trips, newsletter. Um, so I think you know the success of the organization over the past 45 years is really based on a really so solid start um, and really uh, avid participation. Talk a little bit about some of the individual participants. Um, uh, Buck and Nelsa, um, who were basically the leaders of this trip, uh, they went on to, well, they were in the middle of a big research project on the flora of the Olympic Peninsula. And it was really Nelson's project and Buck was kind of the assistant and the driver. Um, at this time, they had published a checklist, but um, then uh, a few years later, when I was in the 90s actually, a book 
uh, for if you don't have it, it, it has really lots of great information. It lists all the species, but also there's a lot of background information and kind of talking about the, the uh, ecological history and um, the biogeography, a lot more detail than I've given. So I, I like this photo because it shows Buck, you know, dressed as he is. He's, he, he looks like he's going for a stroll down the sidewalk in downtown Port Angeles. Um, and then there's Art, you know, all dressed up for uh, formal alpine wear with his backpack, um, you know, like he ordered his gear from Switzerland. Um, and he's prepared, I'm sure he has his 10 essentials in the backpack there. And then behind him is Nelsa. Nelsa's looking at the ground. He's got a bag full of specimens. Um, and then behind Nelsa is Elroy. Um, Elroy might be getting his camera out or something like that. Um, so these are all people I, you know, interact with. Uh, while I was living in Washington, um, stayed overnight with the Buckinghams in Port Angeles uh, a few times when I was doing field work in the area. Went on field trips with Elroy, and I know that uh, Elroy um, was also an avid uh, volunteer in the University of Washington. These people are living anymore. Um, you know, Buck died in 1991, Nelson died in 1999, Art died a few years ago, well into his 90s. Uh, Elroy passed away, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and I know Warren Tanaka, who was also on this trip, I don't have a photo of him, I remember him really well. He was really an explorer and a mountaineer who uh, came to love it, a love of alpine plants from mountain climbing. So I don't know, some of you may know these people may have your own stories to tell. We have time at the end. Um, you know, it might be fun to share some of those. Um, oh, here's a some of the books that came out of the kind of the collective efforts of the botanical community, I guess we could say. Um, you know, Nelsa was the lead author on the flora, but she had a number of collaborators um, with the work on the Olympic Peninsula. What's really amazing is the amount of research that Nelsa did in the pre-internet era, the pre-herbarium specimen database era. She, you know, got, um, scientific paper, papers through interlibrary loan, and she must have traveled to all, all these herbaria to get records, specimen records. So that's pretty remarkable that she was able to do that. Um, a few years later, you know, Art uh, in the 90s um, started a kind of a, a phase of writing books, and uh, he wrote Gardening with Native Plants at the Pacific Northwest. Um, he put out a call for photos. And I submitted some photos for consideration to be used in the book. And actually, I think three of the photos that I took on this trip that I showed in this presentation are in the book. I know the Penstemon is on the back cover of the book. So um, Penstemon Davidson, yeah. Uh, he also wrote Natural History of Puget Sound Country. He wrote books about serpentine, which was his research specialty. Um, so uh, it was great to see you know, what he went on to do. Um, and then also as, as uh, editor of De Glacia, the Native Plant Society newsletter for many years. So anyway, that's it for me. Um, I'll uh, be happy to take questions if there are any, or if anybody has their own memories to share, I think that'd be perfectly applicable too. And I think, uh, you know, Denise has mentioned several times that she's looking ahead to the 50th anniversary the Washington Native Plant Society in five years and a uh, good thing for us all to be thinking about and sharing our, our stories and our photos. So Ed, I don't actually see any questions. Right. I see a comment from Mark Egger, great photos of Art K. Um, and here's one, a comment, great presentation of our history. I love your characterization of the participants. I have a similar picture of Nelsa and her groupies on Graveyard Spit. Oh, mm -hmm. I bet there's a great story that goes with that. Yeah. And then Ernest Thompson also says lovely photos. But I guess your descriptions of the plants were so good that they didn't give rise to any questions. OK, well, Fred Weinman has raised his hand. OK. I don't yeah, actually know can you talk, Fred? Uh, Unmute yourself, Fred. 
Oh, is this? Are you, am I supposed to be talking? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to remind Ed of the last trip I remember going with him on the Native Plant Society backpack to Sawtooth Ridge above Lake Chelan, Sawtooth Ridge, and uh, Art came along. Yeah. And he, he refer he went to REI on his way up there to buy some long johns because he knew it was going to be cold. <laughs> and he ended up with two tops and no bottom. <laughs> and he ex had a long explanation of how he made it through the night with those <laughs> half two half sets of long johns. And I remember that Ed Elverson showed up in the middle of the night up there. If you recall, you hiked in after we had been there and got there after dark, I believe. Well, yeah, I, I think I got a late start and an early exit. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my wife was pregnant and my daughter was born. That's right. Later, and so. they went home. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, that was a lot. Uh, well, we went on some after that, but that was one of the interesting ones with art. Yeah, that was a good one. Okay, I see another comment from Dan Dunphy. This presentation was priceless. Thank you for being the unofficial scribe of the expedition. Yes, well, happy to do so. And um, Mike Rosado says, I hiked the basin a couple of years ago. I wish I had seen this presentation before going up there. Guess I'll have to go back now. Thank you. And then here's an actual question. Tim Hauser is asking, how well can the rhododendron albiflorum do in the Cascade? We live at 1,300 feet outside of North Bend and would like to try it in our native, land, native plant landscape. My understanding is that it's very difficult to grow outside of its native habitat in the subalpine. Um, I know people have tried, and maybe some people have been successful for, for a while, but I, I, I know it has a reputation of being quite difficult. Okay. And then... But maybe some people like a challenge, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Be the one on your block to do it first. Tanya Laswell says, what plants would you want to take photos of now? Well, you know, um, I think if I were up there now, I would come back with 500 photos. <laughs> you know, I, I take photos of everything. And that, that's kind of one indication of how our world has changed and how we engage with it has changed. Um, with digital digital photography, and, and also um, you know social media like iNaturalist, um, the way we uh, the opportunities that we have are, are much greater. So when I look through the plant list, um, you know there's all sorts of other interesting plants that are there, um, and we saw many of them, maybe not all of them. There's one particular plant that um, I I, I found, but I did not take a photo of, and I really should have. It was Polysticum andersonii, which is very uncommon on the Olympic Peninsula. And uh, if I had taken a photo of it, I would have had documentation. Right now, there's no documentation from Royal Basin. It's, all there is is my memory and my wow. feelings. <laughs> um, Shelly Evans wants to know how many times had Nelson been to Royal Basin before this trip, or was this her first trip? Yeah, um, the plant list uh, mentions the sources. So the main source was the list from this trip and a, um, a preview trip that Nelson and Buck took in July of 1980. But also there was a plant list from Nelson from 1987 so subsequent to that, um, I don't actually know uh, whether there were more trips or not. That 
I don't have a good enough memory. She probably mentioned that when we were there though, but I haven't held on to that. And then Shitley also asks, how large an area is it? Um, well, let's see the trail, you know, from the trailhead up to the top of the basin is eight or 10 miles. Um, so, and the width is maybe a half a mile or so before you get to the really steep slopes. Um, the upper basin is maybe a couple miles from the lower end to the upper end. So I, I'm sure that we could have, we could have spent a whole week there exploring different corners of the basin and not, you know, duplicated ourselves. Yeah. And finally, have you been back? I have not been back, no. Um, and that's one of the things about, you know, if I'd been back, um, my memories would probably be kind of mixed up. I wouldn't be as clear about, about the trip. So there's a benefit to not having been back. And, and actually that's kind of true for, you know, all of the botanizing I did in Washington before I moved to Oregon. It's, it's pretty well fixed in my mind. Whereas places I've been to in Oregon, you know, since then, over the last 35 years, it's kind of a blur. It's kind of funny how that works. Yeah. So at the moment, that seems to be it for questions. Okay. Last call. Anybody have a burning issue they want to get out? Yep, so I'm not seeing any. Well, I enjoyed this for, oh, here's one. Um, do you know whether there are any changes due to climate change? That is a good question. And actually uh, another um, value to these old photos is um, for repeat photography to really document changes in vegetation or changes in glaciers, you know, like the Anderson Glacier that I showed the photo of from 1979. It'd be really interesting for somebody to go back with these photos and try to find those same locations and see how it's changed. Yeah. Well, if a whole glacier can melt away, I bet there have been some changes for better or for worse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and in a photo like this, the one that we're looking at, you know, probably uh, the trees have moved a little higher up the slope and uh, you know, the trees that were saplings in 1979 are now, or 1980 are now, um, you know, mature trees. So uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you can also see there's some mortality, some dead trees here, probably some alpine firs. That would be another thing, interesting thing to see is whether there's been additional tree mortality, you know, kind of that forest health aspect of it also. Yeah. And then Ernest Thompson wishes us all a good night. Goodbye group, he says, sleep well. Um, and Diane Doss now says, when I was hanging out a lot with Nelsa and the aging Buck, I once asked Buck if he got bored sitting at the dining room table, reading every day, facing the window to the street. He said, no, his, his head was full of wonderful memories of the places he'd been. So that's kind of what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And Sandra Wakefield says, thank you, inspiring. And I agree. Looks like we have a few more hands raised. So uh... I see that. <laughs> thank you. Um, When I did, so Henry Kuharik says, when I did this hike some 40 years ago, I wish I had seen more of these. You showed the yellow monkey flower, but not, but does the pink, I guess he wanted to say also appear out over there. And yeah, then, well, I've got the plant list in front of me. Let me see if it's on here. Um, It doesn't look like it is, 
I'm looking in the right spot. All the names have changed though, so that makes it harder to look something up on a plant list. <laughs> yeah. And then Kimberly oh. Sims has a comment. I think the goats have been removed since one of them killed a hiker. Okay. Yeah, there was um, a, lot, a lot of concern about the ecological impact of the mountain goats and impacts to uh, the endemic flora in particular. In yeah. Um, and related to that, Shelly asks if from the photos of the goats, was there much evidence of damage by the goats? I, I don't recall seeing much evidence of damage, um, but we weren't specifically looking for that either. Right. I'm pretty sure there were uh, research projects um, going on uh, in rare plant habitats where they were looking specifically at that, and I think they did find some evidence. That's my understanding too. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Diane Doss says, yes, definitely. I don't know if she's referring to damage by goats or that your talk was inspiring. Yeah, probably the damage to go by goats. <laughs> well, um, it's almost eight o'clock. I the question. Oh, here's another couple in the Q and A. Um, Kimberly Sims wants to know if you saw many marmots. I don't have a recollection of marmots and I don't have um, anything in my field notes about marmots. Um, but yeah, the Olympic marmot is an endemic species and I, I do have um, mention of them, seeing them in 1979 when I participated in the University of Washington field class for a few days. And Henry also says they fenced areas to keep the goats out and it made quite a difference. Mm. So I guess they're handling it in several different ways. Interesting. Yeah. And Han Chan says, I haven't been there and now I want to go. Thank you. And Mark Egger says, um, when we hiked out to Mount Angeles in 1983, we saw substantial econo ecological damage from mountain goats, which doesn't surprise me because surprise me they've got, got those sharp hooves. Yeah. Um, and Tim Hauser says, any comments on the changes to the Elwha Valley for Florida with the dam release? Um, regarding the Elwha, that's um, not a topic that I can really speak to because I haven't been back there since the dams were removed. But that's a, definitely a really, um, a really interesting case study in, in habitat restoration. And Shelly, thank you. She says that was a great romp. Thank you so much. Well, it's great to be able to do this in this time when we're a lot of us are kind of stuck at home and kind of itching to get out. And hopefully, we'll be able to get out more this year and um, kind of get back to exploring and seeing the native flora. Right. Looking forward to that. The um, the. Uh, University of Washington Herbarium annual foray is coming down to Oregon in June. So I'm hoping to participate in that. And if any of you are going to be on that, it's going to be a small group just because of the, the you know, the COVID considerations. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing some Washington friends in my home territory. 
Sounds like a great time. What part of Oregon are you going to start? Well, it's going to be in uh, the headwaters of the Willamette River, about uh, uh, 60 miles outside of Eugene. And, and it's a really interesting area because it's kind of transitional between, um, you know, kind of the Washington, Northern Oregon Cascades and then the Klamath Siskiyou region. Sounds great. Yeah. So lots of interesting plants there. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any more questions um, or comments. So, um, we'll probably call it a night. Thanks very much, Ed. This was fascinating. Very good. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Ed. <laughs>